Okay, so welcome everybody to another Transforming Assessment webinar session. Today is the 5th of November and today we are fortunate to have Brant Kutzen from the University of Hong Kong and he's going to be talking about designing uh, online uh, formative and um, interactive assessments. So Brant, would you like to take it away please? Okay, thank you Matthew. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, well, as you can see, the title of the presentation is Building on a Foundation of Participation or Motivating Active Student Engagement in Blended Formative Learning. So as you can see, I work at the University of Hong Kong. I'm a lecturer in the Faculty of Education, specifically on our Master's of Science, IT, and Education program. Um, when I say foundation of participation, and basically the idea is to set up activities where everybody's participating and then you can plan, uh, assume that the participation rate is there and you can plan collaborative activities, group activities. Okay, so as you can see, uh, my passion is online discussions. I was a moderator of a BBS, an online debate forum back in 1983, which is remarkable since I was only five years old then. Nah, not really, but a little humor to start off there. Uh, the heart of Moodle, Thomas Lasik, a leader in the field, uh, termed the forum to be the heart of Moodle. And I've been using the Moodle LMS to support my blended teaching and learning since 2005. Uh, I feel that the forum is the learning activity with the most potential for the social construction of knowledge, but it's also the most likely to fail. And so uh, I would ask some, for some input from the audience. Uh, have you done a forum and have you had a, a problem with it? Uh, why do you think it failed? Just uh, if you could type it in one sentence. I'd love to see some feedback from people. Have you tried a forum and it bombed out? Others don't want to use it. Yeah, students sometimes are hesitant to show their, yes, very low participation. Overwhelming time-wise, right? It's not sustainable. Nobody responded. Yeah, it was just you put it out there and nobody cared. Uh, the question, right, Karen, uh, topic questions are key, not accessible, so they won't do it because they're not going to get any points. Too many students responding, and that's, a, that's a, a sustainability problem, at least you have the participation there. Some students are very dominant, they take over the conversation, drinking from a fire hose, right, you're getting sprayed in the face, uh, how do you make a sense of it all? So way too many voices in the room, Joey, students are taking off, digressing on other topics, the timing of the forum was wrong. Perhaps it wasn't in the right place for the instructional design. They're just too busy, right? They're just too busy to put time into a forum. Great. Uh, anxious people really want to see uh, their, what they put up, and uh, maybe no one's listening to them. So I'll definitely try to address these issues that you're bringing up. Thanks for your feedback. Um, these are key issues that I ran into as well. Keely, no incentive. So how do we give an incentive and yet make it a sustainable activity from the teacher perspective? And how do we make it attractive from the student perspective, both the topic question um, and also keeping it uh, organized in small groups so there's not too many voices? So we'll talk about what works in my experience and why. And I'll talk about some new tools that I've created, enabling discussions as formative learning activity and how to evaluate their success using a learning analytic. Yeah, Angela, a lot of lurkers reading and not posting. So we need to find a way to get everybody out there and actively participating. So that's been my focus. Uh, so let's just do a quick review of blended learning, teaching and learning, adding online activities to expand the learning environment beyond the limited face-to-face -face classroom time. Uh, incorporating external resources into the discussion, creating and supporting learning opportunities which suit the student's schedules, that is asynchronous interaction, not a demand at a certain time. The technology supports new ways to collaborate in groups, and it also gives us excellent transparency into the student learning process. So compared to an assignment where you only see the final outcome, Watching a discussion develop and, and participating and interacting with the students lets us uh, see that as their uh, understanding is developing, perhaps going off into directions which are, are incorrect and in trying to guide that, that learning process. Yeah, you could completely, Sally, you could use it as distance learning as a replacement for classroom time. 
So social constructivism for me started when I started reading John Biggs and he captured the educational value of discussion when he stated good dialogue elicits those activities that shape, elaborate, and deepen understanding. So his paper, um, What the Student Does, was a, an enlightening moment for me and I started changing my teaching style based on, on his ideals of, uh, of getting the student to be an active learner. So this is a chart from, uh, from one of his papers, what the student does, the benefits of active student engagement. So here you have student A, the highly motivated academic student. And even when the, uh, can you guys see my cursor? Sorry, do you see my cursor here? Uh, the arrow pointing to the passive area? Good. All right, then I'll use that. Um, how about the updates? As I'm going through the PowerPoint, does it seem to update uh, fairly in, in synchronous with my, uh, my voice narration? Is it working? All right, I'll assume some of those yeses. Okay, thanks, Matthew. Very good. All right, great. So you see the uh, down here at the level of activity is very passive. So we're talking about a lecture where the teacher does all the talking and the student just sits there. Um, and yet the highly motivated active academic student is already trying to explain to themselves what the teacher is talking about. And as the activity rises up to more of a problem solving or discovery oriented or case based, the academic student quickly rises up to relating ideas together, applying them, and moving up into theorizing. What does it all mean? But student B down here at a, at a passive activity level, just memorizing and note taking. And as the activity level increases, the, the B student, the less academic student, will never uh, get involved uh, until it gets very active. So the the uh, level of engagement of student B will stay very low, uh, maybe only starting to describe when it gets up to this point and explain. But notice that the, this gap between A and B, which was so large here at the low levels and medium levels, tends to narrow. So at the most active levels, even the less academic students should get much more engaged uh, with the problem. So the idea is to, how can we close this gap by the way we teach and the activities that we require of the students. So motivation, how do we encourage student engagement with online activities? We'll look at intrinsic and extrinsic methods, effective use of technology, and our goals are to engage the students in formative learning, to try to motivate the social construction of knowledge. And our, we also want to allow the teacher to focus on quality, not put all their time into quantitative marks. So this needs to be a sustainable teaching practice, something that they can do every week in, every week in, week out. So I find motivation to be uh, um, applicable on three different levels. The first one is constructive alignment between the formative and the summative activities. The second level is situative, how we set up the groupings and the task design to create social pressure. And finally, how can we leverage the power of the LMS, in, in this case Moodle, to provide the structures and automation to drive collaborative learning, try to uh, offload some of this uh, uh, quantitative uh, grunt work, if you will, to the LMS. <clears throat> so here we have the intended learning outcomes. We're going to develop our class uh, curriculum and we want to start with the ILOs and then we design our teaching and learning activities based on the intended learning outcomes and then we decide how we're going to do our summative assessment. So traditionally the teaching and learning activities may be something like a lecture and the summative assessment might be write a paper, write a report, that sort of thing. Only done at the end of the, uh, the term. But more and more we're being asked to support our summative assessments with formative learning activities, something that the students can do on a weekly basis to uh, get actively involved and not just sit there passively and and maybe take notes. So our formative learning activities have to feed back into our teaching and learning activities and replace that note taking with something more active. So now our formative learning activities are in place as teaching and learning activities and we have our alignment between ILOs, 
formative learning activities, and our summative assessment. So as an intended learning outcome, one example would be a very generic one. The students will be able to critically evaluate and reflect upon theories, practice, content, and concepts learned in this course. So I, I intentionally selected a very generic ILO because uh, I think this will apply to just about anybody's course. So there's the ILO, critically evaluate and reflect. But how are we going to uh, summatively assess that? I like the learning portfolio. Uh, I use a cumulative reflection blog. So it's uh, turned in at the end of the term uh, based on weekly activities. So it, it's cumulative. And then they, at the end, they write kind of a capstone meta-analysis of the reflection. So we're trying to stimulate metacognitive thinking. And here's my, my bit of Chinese. I teach in Hong Kong. So um, if uh, one can be inspired by reviewing what one has learned before, then he is qualified, he or she is qualified to be a teacher. Anybody out there read Chinese? Anybody you know, uh, tell if I'm reading it correctly? <laughs> uh, honestly, I can't uh, read Chinese either, but I did learn that phrase because uh, my students find it uh, applicable um, and, I guess, inspirational, a uh, bit of a cross that cultural divide. So my medium of instruction is English in Hong Kong, but uh, occasionally if I can bring in a, a key phrase that, uh, that um, they can kind of respond to culturally, I find that useful. So I use this phrase with my learning portfolios. So the summative assessment is a cumulative reflection blog. But what sort of formative learning activities can support the development of this cumulative reflection blog? I like a weekly discussion forum. Now, typically, I'll have two or three uh, discussion forums going each week for different purposes, projects, uh, analyzing the readings, um, reviewing the lecture material. So I like to start with an oral discussion in class. So I might lecture for 15, 20, 25 minutes at most to set the context and uh, end up with uh, presenting a problem for them to discuss and then giving them 10 minutes in class to have a brief oral discussion. And then that fir their first perspective at the end of the discussion becomes a forum post. And then I ask them to do Q&A, ask questions of each other in their small groups, and answer those questions in their groups, and go back and forth with that for about a week. And they will digress into different topics, but very rarely will I trim off anything. It's mostly, it's all good, right? Any kind of participation is good. If I need to, I'll come in and challenge the, the, the a group, and kind of say, what have you considered this topic, or uh, based on what you're talking about, uh, have you considered this area of inquiry? The average student puts up around five posts a week on each discussion. And the final post at the end of, uh, I usually give them a full two weeks. Even though I start a new forum every week, I usually give the, uh, an extra cushion week, um, so two weeks. But the final post is supposed to be a reflection on their learning. Uh, and those reflections later get harvested into the cumulative reflection blog. So there's the reflective post being copied into a word blog and turned in as the summative assessment. So there we have our ILOs, our TLAs, and our assessment with weekly forum discussions as a formative activity feeding into the cumulative reflection blog. Uh, any questions on this idea of constructive alignment? Oh, Hamid, if you, do, you just type it into your, the chat, I'll try to address it. Teaching and learning activity, Paul. Uh, well, all my work is done online. Um, I ask them to submit it at the end of the term as a Word document. Um, but I also ask them to post uh, their, at midterm, I ask them to post their halfway point on their uh, cumulative reflection blog on a forum, and I can give them public feedback. Um, and how can I ensure that they engage with the forums? Um, we'll definitely address that. How many threads per group, per topic? OK, Rebecca's doing something in IB. Um, all my classes online, I don't do any paper anymore, a cushion week. Um, no, it's because they might get busy with other classes. Um, they might just fall behind. So I give them an extra cushion week, which is also for the people who are really into the discussion to continue the developing depth. 
Uh, no, I mean uh, using a Word document and capturing a blog in the sense of a diary or a journal, Sue, where it's um, not blogger but just a Word document. Fairly low tech, right? But uh, it's also something that I can assume I don't have to teach them how to use blogger. Uh, forum discussions are initiated from a lecture. Do you ever tip it the other way around? Um, I've had students write the topic questions, but frankly, that uh, there, there's a bit of art to it. Um, as I pointed out, I started in 1983 on a debate forum, and I noticed that some topics really have legs and other ones don't. So there's a bit of art to it, um, and I can break it down at the level of taxonomy verbs as to how I progress into my topic questions. How do you ensure they don't write the cumulative reflection only then? Because for one thing, at the middle of the term, I ask them to, to post their midway point. So take what they've got so far and post what you've got started and do a, a halfway point metacognitive uh, reflection. So that kind of forces them to get started. But you're right, um, Brian, that uh, a lot of students don't do anything until I say, let's see what you got at midterm. Critical size for your forum group, I like size five. Uh, three is a minimum. If one drops out, obviously two is a pretty lonely number for discussion. Um, but three works. Five I find optimal, and eight is about the largest. Do students get confused with the Christian week and the new forum? It is a little bit if, if they fall behind, and I warned, warned them about this in the first week. If you fall behind and start doing all your discussions in the second week, you'll, get, uh, you'll feel a little snowed under. How big is too big? Uh, size info is gold dust. Yeah, happy to help. Uh, I've tried a lot of different uh, formulations. I even designed a classroom around tables of size three where the, the, the seats are kind of facing in a bit, a trapezoid on both sides with laptops, just to uh, on that idea of small group discussions. I, I started this uh, design of this activity in, uh, with 16-year-olds. My courses are about, uh, there are eight sessions. Oh, each session once per week uh, with holidays, maybe uh, three months, something like that. Three hour course each day. Uh, no, uh, two weeks would be pretty fast to try to teach them this, this methodology. On the other hand, I've done this and I will attempt to do this today in this uh, seminar where you guys can come online and quickly post. But uh, frankly, I like to phase it in over a period of one or two weeks just to get the ball rolling. Grading the reflection blog, I'll show you the uh, criteria, but I'm looking for reflection. I'm looking for uh, change of perspective, um, recognizing input from your group mates, uh, uh, explicitly uh, quoting things that your group mates gave you, ideas and feedback, um, but mostly change in perspective. And also, can they apply it? Can they take these new ideas and apply it to their past experience? Or can they apply it to future, where they might apply it on their job or in their future um, educational uh, initiatives? Grading about participation, yes, and I'll get to that. It's definitely about participation. Uh, I teach e-learning, uh, Masters of Science IT in education, so e-learning, e uh, leadership using IT in education. I tried using peer review in the past, but uh, frankly, there's too much backstabbing, and uh, you give me an A and I'll give you an A, um, so it just requires too much monitoring. Reflections shared may be different to reflections that are private. Yes, um, this is true, and I'll discuss that, how uh, if students feel that they're being evaluated, uh, particularly in their forum posts, that that warps what they're posting. So it's better to have what I call um, a risk-free environment. Uh, group size five day, what is max? I've done this uh, methodology with um, core courses at the University of Hong Kong, size 120, 140 students. Um, so, yes, you have to set up a lot of little group areas, but once the, the students know how to do it, they set up their group areas themselves. Um, once they know that who's in their group, you know, the first session you do a introduce yourself and then everybody gets in their small groups around topic selections and things like that. But uh, the idea is for um, it to work with any class size and still be manageable. How do others examine the, or grade the blog? Um, well, I grade the blog. Um, but there is some peer feedback at midterm. I asked the students in their groups to give some feedback. Hold on one second, please. Sorry about that. My daughter is learning the recorder downstairs, so I don't know if you could hear it, but I could hear it. All right, everybody hear me okay? So Paul, Phil sends out grading criteria sent out in advance. I do post the uh, the um, 
criteria for the learning portfolio, and I discuss it in the first session so that they know what they'll be evaluated on. Uh, 140 students, how many of you? Um, there was, uh, I was brought in as a, the, the special person to teach them how to do this methodology. There was a main lecturer and a TA, and the TA um, helped organize it. Um, the lecturer did put in some input, and I do recommend that the lecturer, or at least the TA, has some regular involvement. 100% of the assessment for the course, no, it's, uh, I would say that the um, weekly discussions are about 30% typically of the course. And it's important that you do give them a fair amount of points to make it worth their time, because this is a fair amount of time. Each week the students probably spend at least half an hour um, interacting uh, with the course discussions. And I stress to them, it might be even be an hour, but it's not a tough hour. It's not like writing a paper. It's just interacting with your group mates, discussing a topic in a conversational way. So it's not uh, heavy lifting. 30%? Uh, yeah, I would say so. They do try. Um, they want that 30% because they want to get a good A. Uh, I don't know about uh, students around the world. I would say Hong Kong students, Chinese students in general, are highly motivated and work really hard compared to where I come from in the U.S. Students are not as motivated. 20% for a single weekly forum post. 20% Charlotte. When, when I say 30%, that's all the forums together. I would go as high as 50%, actually. But it's all the forum posts together. So you might have uh, several hundred posts uh, every week for 12 weeks. Yeah, I would say so, too. Um, the students should be involved every week for 12 weeks if you're going to give them 20% or 30%. <laughs> Paul, yeah, I learned the record, recorder when I was a kid, too. That's a step up from the kazoo, I guess. All right, let's move on to the next level of motivation, which I term situative. So it depends on sociocultural factors. Um, the culture in Asia is a, you feel a strong duty to support your group, and this creates a peer pressure to perform. The key factors to achieve this motivation are group formation. You have to uh, set up the groups in order to reduce the number of voices in the discussion, and also the task design. You have to make very clear what's expected of the students and what they're expected to do in order to get those points. So when students first come in on the first class session, the initial state is where the students are all individuals. There is no group identity. The teacher is the big authority and the arbiter of their future. Uh, traditional transmission style teaching is often employed, the lecture, and mass assignments for all students are, are given out to, for them all to work on individually. So there is no facilitation of collaboration in this traditional teaching setup. And there's very limited social construction of knowledge. So here, graphically, the teacher is the large uh, sage on the stage, if you will. And the students are all oriented around the teacher. There is no group set up. All the students work individually. So the teacher gives out an assignment. So the white lines indicate the feedback to the students. And generally, because the students are treated individually, the teacher has very little time for customized feedback. A couple of the lines are a bit thicker here and here to show that perhaps the teacher spoke with a student after class or during office hours to explain an assignment. But generally, there's very little individualized uh, support. And so as a result, there's very limited collaboration. These little black arrows show when students might email each other or whisper during class or get together after class and discuss the assignment. But because there's no support, no infrastructure supplied, then there's very little collaboration. So here's an example forum, a Moodle forum, where there's no groups and no task design. This is actually an introduce yourself forum. And as you can see, the replies column, there are no replies. Each student is completely individual. Yeah, Charlotte makes a good point. Uh, challenging the teacher in Asia is, uh, is really rude. Um, so it does take a little bit of uh, practice to make them feel comfortable and relaxed to post publicly. Um, I, I, I make very clear that I'm not going to judge your posts. I'm not going to say this post deserves an A, B, or C um, because it's an automated uh, awarding of points. There is no evaluation, so they're free, and no one's going to judge what they say. And uh, also it helps if you just kind of come across casually. I'm not a Hong Kong person, so they know I'm American, and I, I try to set the tone as much more relaxed and mellow. Um, I explain what laid back means, right? From I, I come from Los Angeles. So. 
So there you go with a traditional forum. And this is very common. This is what I call a public assignment. Each student is posting, and it does have the advantage that they can get some uh, viewing or some, maybe some oral feedback from other students. But there is no um, interaction, no collaboration. And this is what it looks like if you graph it. Um, the discussion. So each topic is set up by one student. And here you can see each student represented by a color. And here's one student replying to another. And this is the time, the y-axis. So this is when I first started to graph discussions and trying to figure out you know, what's working, how I can give feedback to the students. And you can see that in this particular forum, the average number of posts per student is only 0.36, so only a third of the class um, bothered to respond, and um, the other two-thirds of the class didn't post at all. And there's almost no uh, replying to each other, um, only 0 0.03 on interactivity. So there's no groups, no ta uh, there's no real task design other than just asking people to post. Um, and there's no, uh, the, the time dimension is not scaled on the y-axis. So this is back in 2009 or so when I first started to do this. Now, when we do set up groups, uh, I like to set up the groups around a common interest. I'll post, for example, um, up the papers that are the key readings of the course and say, OK, this is a brief synopsis of these different papers. Uh, which students would like to present or uh, be the moderator for a discussion focused on this paper? Um, so that gives the students a reason to uh, form groups around those topics. Or you could just do it by the way they're seated already. Um, once the groups are formed, I ask them to reseat physically, go sit together at their tables. I like small groups around size 5. This sets up what I call proximal access. Um, the, it reduces the gap between the students so they know who they're supposed to talk to. It reduces the social barriers to interaction. It also reduces the noise level. Um, as an example, an analogy might be a cocktail party, where you almost never get 20 or 30 people sitting in a big circle, yet we expect students to have a discussion with 20 or 30 people. At a cocktail party, people always end up gathered in small groups of two, three, four, or five, because it, it reduces the number of voices to a manageable level. So the forum that I've developed called the Participation Forum allows the students to set up their own semi-private areas for discussion focused on their small group level. So this task design creates a structured requirement for interaction. The Participation Forum task, an easy first post. Um, the first topic question might use a verb like list or describe or explain, but certainly no higher than that. Maybe even just identify, something everybody in the class can, can jump onto and get involved. But you have to move on from there with higher level uh, topic questions that ask students to analyze or relate. And then finally, as always, we ask them to reflect at the end of the forum period. Questions to each other gets everybody aware and thinking and starts to take it in some personal directions. Um, so I ask all the, after you have your first post, all the group members should ask somebody in their group a question. And I give some examples. I post a little cheat sheet on the structure. Do they already know each other? Generally not. Um, are they in class physically? Um, they are in class physically, Keeley, um, for the first five sessions. And then the latter three sessions are taught completely online. Yes, physically online earlier and then online later. That works best. Um, you could do it completely online, but uh, without that face-to-face -face time, it's hard to um, overcome that f feeling of distance and um, separation. So after there's questions for everybody, then the answers, I ask them to post answers. So this starts to require some critical thinking or transformative thinking, which is another one of the criteria for the, the grading is transformative thinking for the final cumulative log. Additional rounds of Q&A. This can go around and around, and hopefully it starts to progress in directions the students find useful or edifying. I start the discussion briefly face to face. Yes, definitely this helps a lot. It also, um, I'll show you some examples, the difference between starting a discussion as a homework assignment or starting it in class. And, and when you map it out on a, on a learning analytic, you can see that clearly. Um, social presence or identity is not an issue. Yeah, um, it's, it's important to establish your identity. So another easy way to do that, ask everybody to put up their Moodle profile pictures so that everybody has a face. This really helps continue it, especially when you do go online, that it's the same people you know. 
give examples? Yes, I do give some examples. I also um, ask questions to, to model the behavior of what sort of questions, what sort of challenging but not rude, right? Uh, guiding or asking them to uh, give further examples. And as I said, I give them a little cheat sheet to show the grammatical structures of what it looks like to ask questions. Yeah, pictures make a big difference. And as I said, the uh, final post is reflective. How has your perspective changed from when you started the discussion to where you're at now? So graphically, now the teacher is off to the side, right? The guide on the side, no longer the sage on the stage. The students are all set up in their groups with this example size five and we ask them to interact. Now this first group here, this is the ideal optimal interaction, but in reality some students won't talk to each other. Other students would love to talk to each other, so the thick arrow right there indicates that. So here's some examples of different uh, patterns of student interaction. And I encourage the students to not uh, restrict themselves to their own groups. Uh, no, typically I don't change the groups. I let them stay in their groups unless a group is highly dysfunctional. But uh, um, no, I haven't posted much in the, in the way of transformative questions. Um, that would be a whole different paper. Um, and topic question design is key, frankly. This is an area which is more of a uh, craft, if you will, rather than a science. So you'll see the way that I award the points is very quantitative and scientific, but writing the topic questions is a key art. Um, and frankly, I, when I did this at uh, Lingnan University, um, some professors were put up questions were way too hard and only the A students would attempt them. Other, student, other uh, lecturers put up questions that were way too easy and the discussion wouldn't progress because once you've identified and listed, there's not much to talk about. Play in the recorder, Paul. Uh, that's the sign of dysfunction. Uh, I'll show you um, a graph of a dysfunctional group. So, uh, and I'll, we'll talk briefly about how to manage that. So the white lines indicate now the teacher is interacting. So compare this to the earlier graph where the teacher tried to interact and give feedback to all the students. Here the teacher is more interacting at the group level. And notice that the arrow doesn't really go to an individual student. It's trying to address a crux of an issue, a discussion where the students may have come to a point where they're publicly saying, teacher, can you help us with this? Or we don't really know what, it is, what this means, or perhaps correcting a uh, a misunderstanding of a term, right? That needs to be caught early if the students misunderstand a term. Perhaps they Googled it and took off on a, on a different definition than the educational definition of a word. How are they allowed to ask intergroup questions? Um, the groups are, I don't use Moodle groups per se. Um, when I set up this up, it can be done with 120 or 140 students because I don't uh, have to set up the groups by hand. Later, I found a group choice plugin which uses a, a, a Moodle uh, choice, but it automatically creates the groups around that. And that I use for chats. So that when I do a chat, a synchronous chat in class, then I can restrict the number of voices to a given group. But the forums don't depend on those Moodle groups whatsoever, and this allows the students to discuss in their, in their private group area, but they're also free to wander over and get ideas from other groups. Perhaps their, their group is boring right now, they're not, no one's posting, uh, or they're just more interesting things to, to talk about in other groups, or they can bring back ideas. Perhaps the teacher has posted something really interesting in another group area, and they can bring that back to their own group. Now, what range of subject disciplinaries have you used this with? Um, well, I've run this um, at university level with a wide range business classes, history classes, philosophy classes. It's starting to be introduced in the medical faculty now at the University of Hong Kong. Uh, the groups are semi-private because they can stay in their groups with only five voices or they can just click on another group area and go in there and take a look. Um, and see what other people are talking about and challenge them. Ask them a question. What do you mean by that? So I encourage that and you'll start to see that in, my, in some posts where the students are uh, being graphed. There's a step here in their weekly forum post, post their own answer. Yeah, it's not just about praise. Praise is nice and there's a way, I, I, use, I call that a social comment and you don't earn points for it. It's like a, a thumbs up or a like in Facebook. But I, I stress that I want them to develop what's called a transactive interchange where they 
ask each other questions and answer those questions, and I expect to see deeper progression into the topic, especially based on their own personal experiences, because that's something everybody can share um, that's, that's not uh, you know, just in the content. So building on each other is a key idea, Charlotte, and this is something that I stress to the students, give examples in the first week or two as, as to how I ask questions. Um, I, frankly, I start with the introduce yourself forum because it's easy to introduce yourself, talk about your hobbies, and then people post questions. Oh, really? You windsurf. Where did you windsurf? What kind of board did you use? Right. So this, this idea of progressing through questions and answers can be done in an introduce yourself forum, and then you take that same methodology and apply it to uh, a content domain. And the topic questions, Maria, are key, I agree. Um, yes, transactive interchange, Q&A to go deeper into the topic, exactly. Okay, so this is the graph of what I'm trying to set up um, in my methodology with the forums. And here's an example uh, from one of my forums where I'd use group and task design. You've got uh, six groups here. And notice the number of replies. Now, I think group size here was probably five. So you see, on average, uh, the number of students are, are posting around six, six or seven posts each on average. Um, so this is the kind of depth. And when you graph it, this is what it looks like. So here you have uh, uh, five groups. And you can see here, again, the y-axis is not uh, scaled. The average number of posts is five and a fair level of, of feedback. Uh, you want this feedback to get up pretty high, close to that five number, so that everybody's generally replying and not just posting individually. So group one, you've got a good discussion here going here. And it looks like this, uh, this student blue, we'll call her, is kind of the central column, posting the most uh, regularly and getting some interaction from other students. Uh, group two, you've got uh, not a lot of uh, exchange going except this one post right here from student yellow. Yeah, Paul, this is an example of a learning analytic, the idea of creating a data portrait to help us analyze rather than pouring through the text post, which you do need to go through the text post and read what you haven't read yet. But this also helps me identify the patterns going on in the groups. And as I was saying, that yellow post right there, I should probably read that post because it got three responses from other students, so it's probably an interesting post. Group three, you've got two students that are pretty much the columns of this group, right? The, they're carrying the discussion, interacting regularly, and other students are coming in from the periphery. And group four, a wild and woolly discussion that goes on for a long time, and lots of exchange, lots of different students coming in. And you, you asked for an example of a dysfunctional group. Well, here you go, group five. Um, this is a dysfunctional group. Uh, Mr. Red here is posting, but he's not getting hardly any feedback from anybody else, his group mates. Now, this might be only group size three. So this is also a way for me to spot that um, how students wander over to other groups. Look at Mr. Red. He's not, this is his group, his home group, but he's over here. And when he posts, he gets responses every time. He's responding to this student green, and then the student yellow uh, responds to him. And Mr. Red's also over here, and over here, and over here. So this kind of learning analytic lets me visually spot patterns of how students are moving around and interacting, and who I can, if I posted this up in front of the class, I could say, you know, in group three here, student purple, that's you, Maria, and then uh, student brown over here, that's Charlotte. They're carrying the discussion here. They're logging on regular, regularly. They're um, interacting. So that's a, a very useful thing there. I'm sorry, I'm falling behind here. So several groups appear to have one leader. Yes, there usually is a leader that comes out. Um, does Moodle graph it out of the box? No, Paul. Um, but I have produced a plugin that does, and that's openly available. You can download it and install it on your Moodle server. Um, is it hard to stay on top of? Yes, they do complain. Um, and I try to minimize the number of groups. I started out uh, in 2000. Nine with every single uh, activity had a discussion forum, and it just was way too many. So I started bringing that down to some were just oral discussions, some went into chats, some went into uh, production of a Google document, a shared Google document, and then finally that topic might proceed into a forum. But I started reducing the number of forums to the, to the absolute minimum. Do students drop out, Keely? No, they don't because they want the points. And so they're forced to interact 
um, but hopefully it's an interesting discussion and the social pressure uh, kind of gets, uh, gets students involved and, and supporting the group and hopefully they get intrinsically motivated. Yes, Lynn, I show this to students where the groups don't click and I say, you know, Mr. Red, make, you know, feel free to, to pop around and you know, students brown and dark brown there, what are you doing? You know, your grade is only a D on this particular forum because you only posted once. Uh, seven things to know. Yeah, there's a good post, Charlotte. Thanks for contributing that. Uh, Weak members default to each other to form a weakest group. That does happen. It can be the weakest group and it can be the laziest group. Where um, in my classes, uh, it used to be all Hong Kong students. Now it's around half mainland students speaking Mandarin and the other half uh, speaking Cantonese. And inevitably, the Cantonese students will group on in some groups and the Mandarin speakers will group in another. Yeah, there's the two. Um, Websites Matthew's posted for you can download these plugins. Yep, a different leadership styles, dominating versus facilitating. Can I move group three from group five? So three from group five. I could do that. I could completely disband a group. Um, but usually I don't. Usually I encourage them, like Mr. Red here, to go around and pick up their interaction. Frankly, um, what happens in this, this dysfunctional group is that people like Mr. Red will only put up the first post in their own home group and then they'll do all their Q&A in other groups. They might also put up the reflective post, the final post in their own home group. Yes, Angela, good point. If the group self-selects, this tends to be less of a problem um, because they, they, want to, they want to interact with each other. They have common interests. Okay, so um, this is my big slide where hopefully it all comes together, my, my instructional design of assessment. So we're trying to build formative learning activity. Our goal is a social construction of knowledge. We want to align our formative activities based on our intended learning outcomes, but how are we going to assess them? How do we award points in a manageable way and still motivate the students? So we're really talking about assessment design. Now, teachers, often young, enthusiastic teachers, will often jump in and say, I'm going to assess this forum with a rubric, right? The gold standard of assessment. Write a good rubric and use it to assess this behavior. Um, you still need to do your grouping and task design. If you don't do a good job with grouping and task design, you won't get any collaboration, right? We talked about the public assignment where everybody just responds publicly and there's no interaction or collaboration. But if you do do a good job with the grouping and task design, the students will engage. Now this means with an average class and you're getting five or six posts each by each student in a class size of 25, you'll get two or 300 posts. Okay, post number one, teacher, get out your rubric, uh, evaluate that post. Oh, they also posted over there and over there and over there in these different groups. So you've got to find all those posts by that student A and use your rubric and come up with an overall grade, okay? You spent 15 minutes, you've got a grade in mind for student A, now let's do student B. Out of 25 students, you got 300 posts to do every week. This is not a sustainable activity. You will end up shooting yourself in the head if you try to do this every week. So I, I recommend against trying to use a rubric as a formative weekly activity. So the next week, you make it an optional activity. I, you know, it's not worth any points, but I hope you students see the, the value of posting on this forum. It's not worth any points. Uh, I can say from experience in Asia, you'll get a lack of participation. Only the A students will show off what they can do, um, but that might only be 10% of your class. So the activity will not achieve the ILO, which is usually based on some kind of collaborative activity. So my idea is to leverage the LMS, the power of the learning management system like Moodle where the students construct most of the content in a forum or a wiki or a glossary. The students contribute almost all of the content. Another good one is the workshop for structured peer assessment. So what we're trying to do is find a way to use program point distribution. Now this is not an argument about quizzes. Everybody knows that a uh, Moodle or Blackboard can uh, administer a quiz and automatically give out points for right answers and not give out points for wrong answers. Um, but what about the glossary? Why can't we use this for giving out points when students contribute to a glossary? And what I've set up here is the participation forum. So if you 
try the participation form. In my experience, you'll get basically 100% participation. Everybody wants to get those points. You still have to do a good job with your topic question design and activity management. You have to be involved as a teacher and show that you care. Um, that can be done online during the week. And also, when you come back to class, I usually spend 15 or 20 minutes reviewing the forum discussions, highlighting really good contributions. Um, I don't usually give much negative feedback other than maybe show uh, a, a, the pretty sad progress of a little uh, dysfunctional group and not saying much about it, but everybody can see that they haven't posted much. But generally, it's almost all positive feedback, highlighting the, the really interesting posts. Well, let me see. So if you don't do a good job with your topic questions and your activity management, you'll get disaffected students because you're you're giving out points, you're requiring participation, but it's a boring topic or this, the teacher doesn't seem to really care or monitor what's happening. So you can, you can end up with disaffected students if you require an activity and it's worth points, but you don't really uh, manage it well. But if you do manage it well and you have good topic questions, the students will engage, they'll collaborate, and the intended learning outcome will be achieved. Uh, would all cultural cohorts re re respond in the same way? Um, that's a good question. Um, I've tried this mostly with Asian students, as I say, Hong Kong and mainland Chinese students where English is their second language. Um, they often prefer online activities because they don't have to test out their pronunciation. They're very loath to make a mistake with pronunciation. They'd much rather type in a question in chat or discuss it online because they can think about composing their English uh, and they don't have to pronounce it. Do you have any examples of a neat rubric? I, I steer away from rubrics in general uh, for forum um, posting evaluation. Good topic questions. Uh, in this seminar, I don't think I have any examples of topic questions. Is the participation, participation, partic sorry, participation map visible to the students? I do post it and I show it on the projector, but it's a teacher tool and I'll discuss why. Um, yes, it shows who's not participating and it gives an, a, a kind of an expectation that I, other groups are posting like this. You should also try to log on regularly. Many cultures, Keeley says, prefer collaborative ability of students that might prevent collaboration. That's true. Some of the higher level students have learned from the past that they will get the highest grades by working individually and not carrying weaker group members. Um, but that's hopefully something more from their high school experiences or secondary school as they move up through undergraduate and my classes or master's level. It's, uh, it's not so much about um, regurgitating uh, set answers or model answers, but more about uh, developing a change in perspective by interaction with group mates. So um, I stress that as a key issue for them um, and that there is no model answer. I'm not going to give you a model answer, um, so don't wait for it, right? That you need to interact with your peers and try to develop your own understanding. Yeah, um, in, the, in my experience, face-to-face -face classes, it's very difficult to get students to raise their hand and make a statement. Um, I, as I say, run synchronous chats in class and put it on the projector and I can get 70 or 80 percent of the students to respond uh, with a question that I pose to them in type by typing it as opposed to orally, I might get 10 percent of the students. Uh, what can I figure out the mark out of 30? I'll show you, Meg, in one minute. Uh, everyone says law students hate to cooperate because cooperate they're so competitive. I agree. Everybody um, should be uh, enjoy collaboration, uh, joining together, reaching meaningful goals, exchange of ideas. Uh, yeah, reluctant students. I think it's uh, nobody wants to be embarrassed. Um, the diagram. You mean the uh, the participation map, Keely? Uh, I tried, I asked Blackboard, um, no, there is no plugin for Blackboard, it's just for Moodle and I tried to uh, get Blackboard to, in the, uh, to uh, build in an average function because I originally developed this just as a teaching methodology um, using the average function on the forums um, and then later I developed a plugin for Moodle. Uh, uncomfortable showing the maps to students could put some potentially vulnerable individuals on the spot. Uh, as I say, I rarely give any negative feedback, Maria, um, and you can also uh, generate these plots anonymously. So you only see the group numbers, but you don't see any individuals or any, any um, 
pictures of anybody. So you can you can do it either way. Um, the anonymous mode is also useful for uh, uh, journal articles or conference. Um, putting up work in a conference. So how do we leverage the power of the LMS? The participation forum automatically awards the points based on participation and produces a grade. The first post, you get 6 out of 10 points. Now that's a D by my grade. Two posts, your grade goes up to an 8. Then three posts, 8.6. Four posts, you've got a 9. So I stress the students minimum four posts if you want to get an A. And as it goes up, it continues to rise, but only slightly. More Q&A. Uh, gets a higher grade. Um, so another feedback, most of what we're talking about here um, has been from the teacher perspective of a sustainable formative learning activity. But from the student perspective, um, this idea that your posts are not going to be evaluated uh, is important because it fits in with what Carl Rogers called unconditional positive regard or what Grabinger and Dunlap in their uh, rich environments for active learning, their real paper called a risk-free environment. So an analogy might be a dance class. I want everybody, I want all the students to try to dance. Um, but if, I, if, I, if each student knows that as soon as they get up and start to try to do this tango or waltz, that the teacher is going to be sitting there and saying, well, that student gets an A, that student gets a C. Um, this leads to a, a lot of hesitation, and it actually warps their behavior. They'll start trying to show what they think the teacher wants to see, as opposed to feeling free to dance any way they like. So basically, I want students to participate, um, dance, if you will, any way they like. Um, and the, the peer pressure is what avoids uh, instrumentalism, Ken. Um, there are a few students, I would say less than 10%, that kind of sort of game the system, um, but it's pretty rare. Um, most of the students do get intrinsically motivated. Um, this next chart shows it graphically. So the number of discussion posts starts out with zero, and very quickly with the first post you get a six, and then an eight, and then up here. And my experience is that by the time the students get up to around the third or fourth post, they're pretty much intrinsically motivated. So even though the the increase in the grade is very small, now they're actually kind of getting interested in what their group mates have to say. And so the, the idea is to get everybody dancing and having fun, interacting with each, each other, but not evaluate them, not judging them, not saying you're going to get an A and you're going to get a C and that's an F post, that sort of thing. There's none of that. It's strictly a way to quantitatively award the points. And this frees me up so that I can have all my time goes into qualitative feedback guiding the discussion and uh, um, rewarding students and interacting with students. So the idea here is to set up an assessment method that creates a foundation of participation. Um, in my experience, over 90% of the students will cognitively engage with the discussion. They'll get involved. Um, as always, the teacher's role is to create the educational value the activity, to set up challenging topic questions to guide the exploration, to maintain a visible presence in the forum activity, and to successfully moderate the discussion. Now when I say moderate, here's Salomon's five-stage model of e-moderation, um, teaching them how to access the system and explaining the point system. Uh, that's down here at level one. And then moving up into socializing, uh, learning how to exchange ideas, information exchange. Up here, they start to actually construct knowledge. They're giving each other ideas, giving each other idea feedbacks, or guiding each other into new resources or outside links. And at the highest level, they're developing uh, deeper understanding. So the teacher guides the students up the levels. The Moodle LMS handles the awarding of all the quantitative marks. This leaves the teacher free to focus on quality, monitoring the progress, guiding the discussion, challenging the students. It allows the teacher time for thoughtful qualitative feedback. As a teacher, I generally devote 30 minutes to an hour each week per discussion forum. Do I see any difference between students uh, used to Facebook? Uh, I think it helps. Uh, Facebook is a good example where students uh, obviously feel it's a risk-free environment and they'll post all kinds of outrageous statements because uh, it's mostly just their friends. 
um, and hopefully the students will relax and feel that way about participating in these forums where it's risk free. Um, you can say whatever you like. You can even tell me, you know, that they disagree, and I, th I think uh, you're all wrong there, Brant. Um, I, I tell them that up front. Uh, it's not going to change your grade in the forums at all. Um, and also go back to the students who are gaming the system, very shallow posts. That often comes out in the end, and the cumulative feedback blog is a very shallow blog with very little thought or development of ideas. So they'll pay a price at the end. Thanks, Meg. I, I think getting up and dancing is a good analogy, too, because uh, it's, you just want participation. You don't want to judge them, and you, and you can easily see how that would warp your behavior if you know you're being evaluated. Um, and also, as a teacher, it just, it's just takes way too much time to evaluate each student each week for every single thing they do, especially in a forum where the posts are all over the place. So the map uh, is a learning analytic that I've developed to kind of complement the use of the forum. It automates the production of, the, of this map of discussion activity. It also produces some statistics. Um, cumulative reflection blog, uh, I believe I have that set to 30% of the grade. I think so, something like that. And uh, they also produce a Moodle. In one of my favorite courses, they produce a Moodle course, uh, the entire course as their project. Uh, there's no max call. Um, I've used it up to 140, but frankly, because the students themselves set up their groups, once that's, they've been identified, um, this would work unlimited. It would work in a MOOC, as long as you give the students some way to self-organize into group sizes. Q Phil, I did start with the Q&A forum, um, and I, I evolved this participation forum from that. Um, so this data portrait, to go onto the map, um, I use it to display to students feedback, who is working, what groups are working, and also feedback to me, which approach is working, how is it different from the, how, the same discussion that I used last term, um, how is it different this term. And as I said, there's an anonymous mode. Yes, Lynn, it's uh, openly available. Um, so you can report your research results anonymously. Now this is a uh, one of my first participation maps. This is a fairly typical, yeah, thanks Matt, um, two minutes. Uh, this is one of my first uh, posts from the participation forum, sorry, participation map. Um, and you can see that the, right now there's little smiley faces down there. Those can be replaced by um, Moodle profile pictures. Uh, it also, there's a deadline you see at the top here, two weeks or it could be one week or, or whatever you want to set. It shows the students where the deadline is. And you can see some reflective posts coming in after that period. It also generates uh, group level statistics. How many participants in the group? How many, uh, what's the average number of posts per group? And you can see some of these groups are pretty sparse and some of them are much more busy. You can talk about how they're interacting. You're welcome, Sally. So it also generates uh, forum level statistics. And if we zoom in on that, you can see what the average number of posts is for the entire forum. Now this is a forum, one of my discussions. And you can see here, this is a homework discussion where students don't get involved for several days. This is pretty typical. But if you start the discussion in class, you get much more of a pyramidal shaped discussion where everybody gets involved because it's starting with an oral discussion and I give them maybe five or ten minutes in class to get their first post up and it tends to get much more activity and much more of a pyramid shaped in the discussion. Um, this is a map of procrastination. Here's a group that's reasonably performing and as you can see these groups are waiting until the last few days uh, all the way over here. Yeah, Matt, Matthew, you're, it's fine by me if you want to post the slides on the recording. So this is a way to show students, uh, some groups, are you're procrastinating until the last day or two, and how can you pr be producing a depth of understanding in the last uh, one hour before the forum is due. This is a teacher tool. It appears under course administration. It's a new option called a participation map. Only teachers can do it. Um, it does put a heavy load on the server when it's generating the plot, so I don't normally make it uh, available to students. It lists the forums that you have, and you can plot it normally with pictures, or you can uh, post it anonymously. Yep, thanks for coming, Linda. And um, I've been using it since 2007, and I find it to be an effective way to get a high level of engagement and enables the teacher to focus their time and efforts on qualitative feedback. Uh, do you have any evidence? This is my class here in 2012. I used Moodle uh, plot of activity. And this is my course. And these are all the other courses on the server. So you can see I'm getting about five times the level of other classes. 
and participation. I'm getting what Moodle defines as 18 active users out of 26. And again, that's my course there on the left. And these are all the other courses with maybe less than half the students considered um, active. Yeah, Blackboard was, didn't seem to get, wasn't interested in, uh, in um, uh, opening up their system to uh, enable the plugin. This is a chart that shows uh, it's weighted by enrollment, and the red is the students actually putting up posts, and blue is the number of views. So this is my course, and you can see how many um, per student they're getting about 800 uh, views and about 100 posts. See you later, Meg. And the other, these are the other uh, courses on the server. You can see tiny slivers of red where students are all, each student is posting about one or two posts in these other courses. So it, it is highly effective. Um, and this, frankly, this 6023 course is not even my favorite course. This is uh, another course I teach. So there's my blog, Brant Knudsen SE, and there's the download sites for the, uh, the pr these open source projects. Uh, you feel free to email me, and uh, I'm not going to have time to do the hands-on workshop, Matthew. So obviously, uh, we'll leave that for another day. But uh, if you have questions, feel free to write me, um, and you. Feel free to download. Go to the go to those websites and download the plugins, and ask your uh, server um, technician to install them. Um, the map will work on any version, uh, as well as the forum. We're on 2.7.1 right now, Moodle, um, and it'll it's it's currently running on our servers here at the University of Hong Kong. Um, I'm uh, finishing up my doctorate this year, so I'll put that out there that I'm interested in uh, other teaching and learning. Uh, the roles around the world. If you are interested in this kind of work um, I, and have an uh, opportunity, I'd be interested in hearing about it. Deb, you're welcome. Matt Maria, glad you found it useful. Any questions? Frank, welcome. Bye bye, Ken. Okay, Rebecca. You're welcome, Keely. Yeah, let me know how it goes, Phil. I see you want to ask a question. I think she's applauding. Thanks, I think is it Astrid. Um, Phil, to answer your question, there's uh, two ways you can um, tag your posts. One is a substantive contribution that you feel you deserve to get an increase in your points. Or you can put up a post that just says, love your post, or that's great, and then tag it as a social comment. And then you, it, you don't get an increase in your points, but it allows students to kind of put up those good job posts without a lot of content. Yeah, and let me know how it goes. Gary, you're welcome. Thanks, Phil. Carl, you're welcome. Mary, I'm glad you found it useful. Let me know if you uh, how it goes for you if you get a chance to try it. Rhonda, you're welcome. Yeah, let me know. Download it. Give it a go. Um, it's very the participation map plugin is very independent of the the rest of Moodle. Uh, it'll work on a normal forum. You just unclick the box that says the first post is a group post, um, and then it'll plot it normally for any even a regular native Moodle forum. Um, obviously, I designed it to work with my my participation forum, and it assumes that the first post is a group post. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, desire to learn. Is it PHP? Yeah, is desire to learn written in PHP code? Bhavani. Bhavani. I think yeah. desire to learn is a closed source system, so I'm not sure. Yeah, then if it's closed it's source. source like yeah. You'd have to have yeah. the ability to add to, in a plugin. Yeah. So Latrobe, uh, great to hear. Um, I, I've heard good things about Latrobe. I know they're a leader. Um, they were the first to adopt Moodle 2 in the world. So uh, that's a very interesting university to me. Um, I'd like to see how if Latrobe would adopt it. 
I wish you cured a dot noodle. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of places, I think, are looking at Blackboard as kind of a, another revenue stream they don't want to support. Yeah, and uh, I like Latrobe. I think they're they're doing a great job there. They they definitely a progressive university. As I pointed out, uh, I'm finishing up my doctorate this year, and I'm looking for teaching and learning posts around the world. I'm interested. So if you know of any good opportunities out there. Um, I'm doing this kind of work with open open discussion forums, and also I'm exploring the virtual world using uh, Second Life and uh, for training scenarios. Yeah, Murdoch, Murdoch University, University of South Wales. I, I like Australia. I'd be interested. Okay. Big Moodle users. Obviously, I'd rather work at a place that uses Moodle rather than Blackboard. Um, an LMS, any LMS, is better than nothing. But uh, if it's open source and, and it allows me to expand and uh, guide the activities or you know customize the activities to, to to suit my teaching methodology, well, that's I think a better way to go. You're a bomb, Charlotte. Thanks, Lynn. Worcester, is that how you say it? Worcester, Worcestershire. That's how my mom told me to say it anyways. Worcestershire sauce. Not Worcester. Worcestershire. In the Shire. Worcestershire, 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 and then the Shire Reef, right? The the Reef, the the law of the land was the Shire Reef, and that became the American Sheriff. Just thought I'd throw that out there. Thanks, Len. I'll keep practicing. Yep, the Shire Reef became the American Sheriff in the Wild West. Are we allowed to digress into various topics here, Matthew? <laughs> you can say whatever you like, <laughs> as long as it's not naughty. <laughs> yep, I'll keep it on the uh, the PG rating. So as you can see, I was going to do a workshop. Um, there's the Bitly um, URL. You feel free to log on to there um, and to check it out. That's where I'm doing some work with uh, the virtual world. Thanks, Charlotte. This is why I'm interested as a uh, in the teaching and learning field. Um, in a, uh, what do they call those departments for teaching and learning excellence or various names, teaching and learning center, like I worked at the Lingnan University. Um, I did a lot of professional development for my faculty. Um, but frankly, it can be a bit of an uphill battle sometimes, especially in the education faculty, where most of the people with PhDs already feel that they know everything there is to know about teaching. So how can this, uh, this young whippersnapper teach me anything? That newfangled technology. Yeah, as I say, Charlotte, I think the their the basic um, self concept is that they already are have a PhD in education. So how can someone teach them about teaching? So yeah, I would say I've been doing a lot of work with the medical faculty, and they're much more open to one, use of technology, and two, um, new, more effective ways of teaching. Um, what really kills me is when uh, these, these dinosaurs in the education faculty will lecture about social constructivism. And as you say, Carrie, they basically teach online just the same way they teach in the classroom, which is one-way transmission of knowledge, the talking head that just keeps on talking, and very few interactive activities. Yep, there you go. The medical faculty is a leader in learning and teaching. So that's been my experience as well here in, in Hong Kong, um, also for adopting uh, the virtual world, uh, using Second Life or uh, Unity. Yeah, definitely. 
you know, one thing I could do since I'm sharing my desktop, I might run the, if I can find it, run one of these links. Can you see my screen, Matthew? Yep, it's coming through. This is a uh, um, recording of a training scenario for lab safety, uh, about fire safety. Here they turn on the Bunsen burner, and what are you going to do? This alcohol bottle lights up at the same time. So you're given choices one, two, or three. Will these work with Moodle 2.6? Yes, David. They're currently running on 2.7. So they did work on 2.6, and they will work on 2.7.1. Yeah, Second Life for practicing ear operations, definitely. Here they're learning how to put out a fire, and sometimes things go wrong. Even when you try to put out a fire, the bottle of alcohol spills over and pours out into a puddle, lights up, and lights up all those boxes, which shouldn't have been there in the first place, since they're all piled up to the ceiling. And now, should you keep trying to put out the fire? No, it should run out. Thanks, David. Glad you enjoyed it. And so this is my avatar running out. So this is just a video recording. Um, the idea is for each student to come in here with their own avatar and explore this environment. The students will recognize the, the, all the equipment because it's based on pictures that were taken of real equipment and uh, hopefully develop some ideas in the virtual world. And the reason I bring this up is because I'm currently exploring the use of online discussion forums to create depth in, the, uh, in an activity instead of just um, just in, uh, the, the exciting excitement of the virtual world, but to follow it up with an online discussion to build depth of understanding. So how do we do, Matthew? Uh, how many people were online? Did you get a count? Uh, I think we got up to about 52, all told. I was looking Not at bad. The total. There was quite a few late stragglers, but you know, I think they've got the guts of it. <laughs> yeah, can't exactly lock the doors. <laughs> Well, you probably could, but why would you want to? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's not like they're going to disturb anybody by coming in late. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to stop the recording here, um, but people can stick around and chit chat if you want. But um, if thank you, you for that. That was really good. Um, and hopefully we can have another chance to play with the um, with the the workshop version of a webinar, perhaps in the yeah. future. Sorry we ran over time there, but uh, given there was so much interesting feedback from the audience, uh, I would be happy to interact with them. Um, so that was kind of the trade-off instead of going to the hands-on workshop. Yep. Okay. So thank you again. Um, recording stopping.